guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 66, Luke chapter 22. Crazy enough, we're almost done with the Gospel of Luke. Kevin, how many chapters are in the Gospel of Luke? 24. Yes, Kevin, you said that with confidence. Maybe it's your buddy that's next to you. Uh, I'd love to welcome everybody, Josh Edwards. And Josh is gonna be teaching, uh, actually tomorrow, Josh is one of our team members. Love what he's doing in Minnesota. We've got Jeff, we've got Rich, we've got Tom, the regulars. And so here we are, you guys, hard to imagine. We're wrapping up the Synoptic Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of these things that paint a different picture of Christ, but all of them point that he's Messiah. Some of them, uh, you know, in, in Matthew, they portray Jesus as the king, and Mark, they portray him as Jesus as servant. And here we are in the Gospel of Luke portraying, what I love about what Dr. Dr. Luke does is he portrays Jesus as the Son of Man. God becomes human flesh. So we begin to see the humanity side of Jesus, which is why I love Mindy's painting. You know, here we have Jesus because he's hanging out, remember, with tax collectors. And I, I love the line, and sinners. <laughs> that would be all of us. And Jesus interacts with the tax collectors and sinners. And why? Because he wants to hang out at the table. Why is this important? Because Mindy's painting, I think, is an incredible picture of what Christ really wants to do. Think about this. In Genesis, here you have the apple that represents the fall of man through Adam and Eve. But then on the flip side, it's just a cool picture. How do we combat the fall of man? Well, through the bread and the cup, through what Christ did on the cross. And so we're going to walk through, which we haven't done yet, crazy enough, in Matthew and Mark, and now here we are in Luke. We're going to actually walk through the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the Lord's table, where he invites every one of us to come to the table. It's an incredible picture, and I have to just be honest, here you have Christ in His image and His hands blessing those. I mean, Christ wants to touch every single one of us. Well, in order to get a backdrop in, in Luke 22, verses 1 through 6, really we begin to see the festival of the unleavened bread, which is called Passover. It was drawing near. And you begin to see what we would call the plot to kill Christ. I mean, all of these predictions, and even in Mark, just because I love to go to Kevin on this one. Kevin, do you remember how many times Jesus talks about the prediction of His death? Three times. What I love is, is, is that like we're really starting to get into the heart and the substance of why Christ was sent here on earth, why the Son of Man came here for you and I. And then you have in verses 7 through 13, how, how are we supposed to get ready for the Son of Man? Well, in 7 through 13, he asks his disciples, this is classic, right, in verse 9, well, hey, where do you want us to prepare this Passover? Where do you want us to prepare this meal? And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to enter a city. There's going to be a man carrying a water jug that will meet you. Usually, that, that in itself is already different because usually it was women. So I want you to find a guy carrying a water jug and then just, by the way, stalk him. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it says. Follow him into the house that he enters. Oh, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing following me? You know, I mean, yeah, and oh, by the way, if they see you following me, uh, this is what you should say, right? They say, well, uh, tell the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? And so literally every time, you guys, we are to get ready for the, the, the Son of Man, He already has prepared for us. He's already gone ahead. We just got to continue to walk it out. So here they are finding a guest room. Here they're finding a large furnished, furnished room. Isn't that awesome? Oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a place exactly what you need. Make the preparations there. So they went and they found it in verse 13, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, this preparation of Passover, I mean, to me, it's incredible because what is it painting a picture of, Kevin? It's his death and resurrection. Yeah, but go back at that point. That is true. But go back to the Old Testament here. Old Testament's the angel of death passed over when the blood was painted on the, in Egypt. That's right. On the doorposts and all the lintels, right? And so here you have the blood. And so they're still celebrating. In fact, Kevin, would you go there? Go to Exodus 12, verse 14. I think this is really important. Jesus is still remembering. He's still uh, in a remembrance. Look, this day is to be a memorial for you. And you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You're to celebrate it. Look at this. Throughout your generations as a permanent statute. So Jesus is honoring the words of, of Moses. This is really important because when we talk about the Lord's table, when we talk about the Eucharist, the Lord's table, everything is going to eventually become the same mentality of a remembrance, of a memorial. We're going to take it one step further in today's text, but this is the backdrop. This is the picture. This is what the image is. And now, here's what I love about what you said earlier, Kevin, is that, you know, the Passover also not only is it a reflection of the past, but it's also a prediction of the future. 
And so one commentator just says this, and, and I love what Wearsby says, is it's a greater exodus that takes place on the cross. Think about this. It's a greater exodus in, from Egypt, but now we have a greater exodus on the cross. In Luke 9, verse 31, let's go there. It says this, they appeared in glory and were speaking of his death. What was about to take place, it says, which was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So here you're going to see a comparison of one exodus to a second exodus. And this is where we begin to start our text. In Luke 22, verse 14, it says this, When the hour came, he, meaning Jesus, it says he reclined at the table. I still love this. Like when you think of the table here, we always picture uh, you know, the chairs that you guys are sitting in. We picture normal four-legged chairs. That's true, but man, the reality is most of them were always laying down as they're eating. They're always leaning to their side. And so when it says he reclined, like literally, it actually means not on the table. <laughs> it says at the table. So Jesus, it says, he reclined at the table and who was with him? The apostles were with him. Now, this is cool. Wearsby says this. Here's your setting, okay? Jesus serves as the host. Okay. Now, when the disciples would come into a context, anytime he would always meet the disciples with a traditional kiss of peace. Okay. The men always reclined around the table. And we know based on John 13, 23, Kevin, if you'd go there. Now, remember, we're going to interweave the other gospels just so you have a bigger picture of what this looks like at the table. Now, watch this. It says one of his disciples, the one Jesus loved. We're going to talk about this as we get into the gospel of John, but that's obviously John. He was reclining close beside Jesus, but we also know here that Judas, okay, was on his left, and we know that John was on his right. Now, think about this, you guys. Jesus kisses all of the 12 disciples. That would have been a common, traditional thing to do at the table. Now, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, Kevin, if you'll go there, Ephesians 2, 20. I, I think this is really important, because the end of the story is really important about who was actually at the table. Now think about this. It says, and the apostles. Now the apostles are who? The things that were built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is the 12. This is literally the 12 disciples, 12 apostles that were with Jesus. Now, okay, think about this. This is what he says in verse 15. Uh, yeah, after, let's go to there. No, let me, let me say something else here real quick. After uh, there would have been the kiss, after there would have been the greeting, okay, in John 13, really 1 through 20, I want to kind of just keep painting a bigger picture that's not in the Gospel of Luke, which I don't normally do. I don't normally integrate the other stories, but I think for a bigger picture here, understand this, that Jesus, remember, after he had kissed him, he arose, he girded himself with a towel. And you guys remember what he did once he put the towel on? He washed their feet. Yeah, he washed their feet. Who was at the table? All 12 disciples, all 12 apostles. One of those was Judas. So not only does he kiss Judas, but now not only is he washing Judas's feet. And here, here's the crazy thing. Jesus models, when you wash feet, you're modeling servanthood. You're modeling humility. And you guys remember at the end of John, they're arguing about who's the greatest. Even in Luke, hey, who's the greatest? It's kind of like they kind of lost their focus. But Jesus, as a gracious host, kissed them, washes their feet. Then you can jump into verse 15, Kevin, of Luke 22. That's just kind of a little bit of our backdrop. It says this, then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Man, that's just a weird phrase. I fervently desired to eat this Passover. Let's just talk about this. I, I know you already know the answer in regards to the rest of the story. What do you think that means, I fervently desired to eat this Passover? Why? I think he knew that it was going to be a fulfillment of what he mm -hmm. was supposed to do, the cup that he was supposed yeah. to bear. I mean, he knew... One, this was his last dinner. Two, what you're exactly what you're saying. He knew that this was a fulfillment of what's to come. And I have to be honest, you guys, and I, I've kind of started to get a little bit more aggressive in this communication piece. You guys, when the prophetic word is there, you pursue it. When you have a prophetic word and it's based on the word of God and it is truth, I really believe you pursue it with everything you have. Why? Because I believe you could actually walk out what Scripture is intended, and it could be your life. I mean, think about Joseph. He knew he had to go to Egypt. He knew he had to leave Egypt. He knew he had to be, take his son to Bethlehem. Why? Because of the prophetic word. Why did Jesus read in Nazareth, right? What did he read? Luke 4. Because he needed to fulfill Isaiah 61.
You see, Jesus had to pursue. He knew the word of God based on Isaiah 61. He needed to pursue the prophetic word in Luke 4. And he says, today this is fulfilled. Remember this, you guys. I love the, he, Jesus knew the word. He is the word. We're going to get into the gospel of John. He is the word because he is the word. He's going to walk out the fulfillment of what it says. I mean, Kevin, let's go back to the theme verse of, of Revive School, Matthew 5, verse 17. Uh, I love this. The law and the prophets, what do they do? Everything they do, it points to the coming Messiah. It points to the Messiah. In Matthew 5, 17, it says, don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus knew that what this dinner was going to not only represent, but actually begin to take place was going to point to his death, burial, and, and resurrection. In verse 15, just as a summary, he says, then he said, I have fervently, I have this passion inside of my heart. And John 13, 1, can you go there real, real quick, Kevin? John 13, 1, it just says this. Before the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own. That's the image I want you to think about, fervently desired. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Because of his love, he had this fervent desire back in verse 15 of Luke 22, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This is the best meal that he, that he could have ever had. And then it says, interesting enough in verse 16 of Luke 22, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of, of God. Man, this is, this is crazy, okay? So this is my last meal. I love this. This is, this is really, this is it. And I think this is really cool. Tom Constable, one of the, my former professors, he just said this, Jesus wouldn't eat another Passover meal until his own sacrificial death. And in fact, here's what Constable says even more. He would eat with them again. You ready for this? Next in the kingdom of God. Specifically, here it is, it's kind of a bigger phrase, at the messianic banquet at the beginning of the kingdom. So the next time he's gonna have an incredible meal, it's gonna be at, at the banquet. Think about this, Kevin, can you go to Revelation 19, verse six? Here's an incredible picture about what Jesus, again, he's walking into fulfillment, but then he also drops another prophecy. And this is the picture that we have in Re Revelation 19, uh, really, Kevin, let's, let's just jump to verse 9, if you don't mind. Revelation 19, verse 9. Here it is. He, then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. Th this is what Jesus is talking about, y'all. When he's talking about, oh, by the way, I'm not going to eat again until it's fulfilled with the kingdom of God. He's talking about Revelation 19. So then it says in verse 17, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. And you're kind of like, okay, if you don't know anything about Judaism or anything of Jewish roots, this really isn't going to make any sense to you. Okay. We do know that there are four cups. Now there's a big argument about, and this is serious about, is this the first cup or the third cup? Here's when you would take the cups, okay? Let me just tell you this, regardless of where you land. Okay, one is, is that you would always have a cup with, this is during your Passover meal, with the preliminary course to bless the day. Now, when you look at this one and it says, and after giving thanks, you would naturally kind of tend to say, this probably is the first cup. That's kind of what you think based on after giving thanks. Can I prove that? No, because a lot of people still say it's the third cup. Now, here's the second cup. After a liturgical explanation, for why the day was celebrated and how it coincided, and then it coincided with the singing of, and I'm gonna say this wrong, Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L, Hallel? Hallel Psalms. So that's the second cup. Now the third cup you would drink following, here it is, now listen to this, the meal of the lamb, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. I tend to say it's more of the first cup because at this point they haven't participated in lamb or unleavened bread or bitter herbs. I think that's a fair statement. But man, some of the greatest theologians that I respect, they really are divided on this. Now there's the fourth cup, okay? So you have four cups during the Passover meal. Have you guys all participated in a Passover meal sometime at your church or? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Tom? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Tom, know if you had four cups or not. No. Okay. <laughs> and the fourth cup is it would be following the concluding portion of the Hallel Psalms again. So 
four cups that you would participate through a, a meal, okay? Now, go back to, if you can, verse 17. Then Jesus, he took a cup. This would have been a common cup, okay? It would have just been one cup. How do we know that? Because look what he says at the end. Take this and share it among yourselves. So now, can I mess with some of your theology just for a second? Nope. Yes, I'm going to. <laughs> I think, I love the image of when you take communion, just use one cup. Now, is it a big deal if you don't? No, absolutely not. But you know how we always use the little cups, right, Kevin, when we do the logistics, right? I, I love when people come up yeah. and they participate with one cup. There's something about uh, a spirit of unity, we'll even get into that, about all of us participating, and that's a key word, in the cup. Not, not many cups. Again, I'm not caught up if you do that because you're like, ah, oh, it's easier to do that. I just, I love that imagery. Just a cool picture. Again, you still see one, one cup. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink, look at this text, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So what is he saying again? He's implying, isn't he not? The same thing, right, that he just said in verse 16. Verse 16 says, I will not participate, I will not eat until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now he's just saying, I will not drink. So he's using this image of eat and drink. None of it's going to happen again until all of a sudden the big banquet the ultimate messianic banquet. And so he's reiterating, guys, this is my last one with you. And then in verse 19, it's an awesome picture. It says, then he, he took the bread and he gave thanks. I mean, look at this. He, he literally, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body which is given for you. And then he says a phrase that I think I want to just camp out on, right? And obviously the body is a representation. The bread is a representation of, of his body. And just so you know, it would have been unleavened bread, right? Unleavened bread because in Deuteronomy 16, 3, if we can go there, uh, remember all of this Passover uh, festival, of unleavened bread, all of this comes together. And he says, you must not eat unleavened bread with it. For seven days you'd eat unleavened bread with it, the bread of hardship, uh, because you left the land of Egypt in a hurry. Remember, we didn't have time for it to rise. We don't have time for that, guys, so that you may remember the rest of your life the day you left the land of Egypt. Kevin, you're always good at this answer. Why would it have been unleavened bread? What does it represent? It represents sin. Yeah, sin. So uh, here's what I want you to do, you guys. I'm going to take the bread, Jesus says. He gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to them. And then he said, this is my body. Now, again, this is going to sound like a weird tie-in. You're like, God, you're really stretching it here. When it says one cup, it also says one body. And so I think for me, this is all from one person, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. I know that sounds weird, but sometimes I think we picture multiple bodies. I don't know why we do that. We're the body of Christ. And yet we're so divided. And what you see in Luke 22 is... It's really people coming to the table based on one body and one cup, based on what he has done for us. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. I mean, you guys, there's a couple things here. Here you have, as, as Nelson says, this meal at the table it represents, yes, the memorial of his death. It also represents a fellowship meal of unity. But then it also talks about, and we're going to really get into this, the, proclam the proclamation and the anticipation of his return. There's so many layers to this. And so let's just begin, if we can, let's begin to unpack all of this. Now think about this, okay? We're going to go back to the Old Testament. That's all we know, right? That's all these guys knew. Kevin, if you would, would you go to, the, would you go to Leviticus 6.26? Uh, the priest who offers it as a sin offering is to eat it. It must be eaten in a holy place in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. So the sin offering, who's supposed to eat it? Priest. 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 So the sin offering, now watch, this is all beginning to, you're going to all make, this is all going to start making sense. Now also, Kevin, would you go to Leviticus 7.15? Okay, remember, this is all they knew, you guys. All they knew was offerings and sacrifices. So here you have a fellowship sacrifice. You guys remember who got to participate in a fellowship sacrifice? Look, Leviticus 7.15. The meat of his Thanksgiving sacrifice of fellowship must be eaten on the day he offers it. He may not leave in any of it until the morning. So here you have, Two people. So not only does the priest participate in this offering, but so does those who are giving 
up this component. Now, here's where it kind of, in, in my opinion, it, it just, it begins to, uh, I guess, put it, put it all together. Uh, can you go, Kevin, uh, can you go to Hebrews 10, verse 14? Go to Hebrews 10, verse 14. For by one offering, he's perfected those, forever those who are sanctified. So when you see Hebrews 10, 14, we know that what? How many offerings is there? One. So in the Old Testament, there was a sin offering. There's a fellowship sacrifice. Those were continuing to take place, continuing to take place, continuing to take place. Why does Jesus say, this is really cool, this is my last one before I come? Think about this, because he doesn't have to do a sacrifice again. He doesn't have to do another offering again. It's done. For by one offering, so all of that in the past, it's, you had to keep doing it, keep doing it. And this time he's saying, this is it, you guys, until I come back at the Messianic banquet. Like, this is it. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, if you'll go there, Kevin. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. it's a beautiful Beautiful picture of what Paul talks about. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if there's one offering, I hope you guys, I hope this is making sense in your, in your heart here. Jesus did one offering. And so until the Son of Man comes back in Revelation 19, when we see that he's going to come back for the table, our job is to continue to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So how do we do this? How do we continue to proclaim this? We must continue to partake, I mean, in the Lord's table. Every time we partake in this, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. It's almost like this is how we're supposed to get ready for the return of Christ. Kevin, go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. It says, the cup of blessing that we give thanks for is not a sharing in the blood of Christ. The, bre the bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And then go to verse 18. Because there's, uh, yeah, look at the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in what is offered on the altar. When we partake in the bread and in the cup, we are participating in what Christ went through. That makes sense? which is why we have to proclaim, why we have to proclaim what he's done for us. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Uh, it's an awesome picture of, it, it, it's, it's the switch. It's the old to the new. And the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So right now, you guys, Jesus is beginning to say, here's what's happening. A new covenant is taking place. And oh, by the way, it's what the prophet Jeremiah said in verse 32. He says, this one, will, in, <laughs> this one here says this, will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke even though I, I married them, the Lord's declaration. Now, in verse 33 says this, instead, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. And here it is, the Lord's declaration. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. The shift is now beginning because of this meal. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 34, no longer one will teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. This is what you will begin to see the old it's like, look, the sin offering and the fellowship sacrifice. Now, what does it do? It transitions to the new covenant, to, if we can really just say, the new offering. Luke 22, verse 20, I do want to get through this. It says, in the same way, he also took the cup, right? Remember, he had just taken the bread. And I know we, we, I, I'm not teaching this like you would maybe participate in communion, like you would expect it to be here and then here. But then in verse 20, it says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, remember, this would be a different cup. This is probably the third cup, the cup that would probably be the strongest point to saying a cup of redemption. This cup is the new covenant. And here's what we're talking about. Established by my blood, it is shed for you. You guys, he's saying my time is coming. In verse 21, as, and there's so much here. There's so much about this comes literally through the blood of Christ. 
to make it even more plain, he is saying, you guys, back to verse 20, my blood, it is shed for you. It's because I'm going to die on the cross and for three days I'm going to be dead and on the third day I'm going to come back to life. But all of that is possible because of my, my blood. Remember Leviticus 17, 11, life is in the blood. And he says, now there's a new covenant and it's coming through my offering and it only happens once. And in verse 21, he says, but look, as he's around the table, the table of people that he invited to the table. Do you guys remember? You got to understand something. The night before he chose his disciples, he prayed. He specifically prayed and he walked out what he heard from the Lord. And so he even picked the one that was going to betray him. That concept to me is extremely radical and ridiculous. But he says, but look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. Everybody has to be in shock. Everybody has to be like, wait, what are you talking about? The guy that's sitting at the table right here. Like none of this, none of this has to make sense. And yet the disciples were puzzled by this announcement. Did they not remember? He already had said it twice in the Gospel of Matthew. There's going to be somebody that, that, that denies me. Matthew 17, verse 22. So what he's saying about the hand betraying me at, at the table, this isn't new news. In fact, Matthew 17, 22, it says, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. He already said it once. And then guess what? In Matthew 20, verse 18, he says it again. Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to, de to death. Twice, Jesus tells his disciples. So if you go back to Luke 22, verse 21, he says, the one that's betraying me, I don't know why they're shocked, but there is. And it says in verse 22, for the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined. But woe to that man, Judas, by whom he is betrayed. They began to argue among themselves, which one of them could it be who was going to do this? You play this weird game about who's going to turn your back against Jesus. And I know we're short on time here, but I want to just give you three simple points. You guys, why do we do the Lord's table? One is, is that we have been asked to remember. Remember everything that he has done. Luke 22, verse 19, do this in remembrance of me. But not only do we do this as a remembrance, we do this to participate. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, we are asked to participate in what Christ has done for us. In fact, Kevin, can you go to John 6, verse 53? This is the radical one. This is the one that gives everybody like the EBGBs. <laughs> He says, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life in yourselves. We are to participate in how Christ lived His life. We know how, did he part how do we participate in Mark 8, verse 34. We are supposed to deny ourselves. We're supposed to take up the cross and we're supposed to follow, follow Him. That's how we participate, literally, in the bread and the cup. And then finally, as we remember what he's done, as we participate in what he's done, we must, we must, we must look to proclaim his death until he comes back. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, guys, bless you. Thanks for listening and uh, look forward to tomorrow as we get to hear from Josh. Thanks.